of survival or think of life and survival, survival mode as picturing an animal such as a deer contentedly grazing in the forest. And so now let's assume that it's in homeostasis in a perfect state of balance. But if it perceives some sort of danger from the outside world, let's say a predator or its fight or flight nervous system, you know, will obviously get turned on. So this sympathetic nervous system is part of the autonomic nervous system, which maintains the body's automatic functions, such as digestion, temperature, regulation, blood sugar levels, and the like. So to prepare the animal to deal with the emergency it has detected, the body is chemically altered and the sympathetic nervous system automatically activates the adrenal glands to mobilize enormous amounts of energy. So if the deer is chased by a pack of coyotes, it utilizes the energy to flee. If it is nimble enough, to get away unharmed, then perhaps 15 to 20 minutes when the threat is no longer present, the animal then resumes grazing. Its internal balance is restored. So we humans have the same system in place. When we perceive danger, our sympathetic nervous system is turned on and energy is mobilized and so on in much the same way as the deer. So during early human history, this wonderfully adaptive response helped us confront levels of threat from predators and other risks to our survival. So those animal qualities served us well for our evolution. Thought alone can trigger the human stress response and keep it going. So unfortunately, there are several differences between Homo sapiens and our planetary cohabitants in the animal kingdom that don't serve us well. Every time we knock the body out of chemical balance, that's called stress. And the stress response is how the body innately responds when it's knocked out of balance and what it does to return back to equilibrium. So whether we see a lion in the Serengeti or bump into a not so friendly ex at the grocery store or freak out on the freeway because of traffic or because we're late for an appointment, or a meeting, we turn on the stress response because we are reacting to the external environment. So unlike animals, we have the ability to turn on the fight or flight response by thought alone. So and that thought doesn't have to be about anything in our present circumstance. We can turn on that response in anticipation of some future event. So even more disadvantageous, we can produce the same stress response by revisiting an unhappy memory of the past that is stitched into the fabric of our brain's gray matter. So either we anticipate the stress response producing experiences that we recollect or we recollect them and our bodies are either existing in the future or in the past. So to our detriment, we turn short-term stressful situations into long-term ones. So on the other hand, as far as we can tell, animals don't have the ability, or should I say disability, to turn on the stress response so frequently and so easily that they can't turn it off. That deer will go back to its happy grazing, isn't consumed with thoughts about what just happened a few moments ago let alone uh, you know, the time a coyote chased it two months ago. This kind of repetitive stress is harmful to us because no organism was designed with a mechanism to deal with negative effects on the body when the stress response is turned on with great frequency and for long durations of time. So in other words, no creature can avoid the consequence of living in long-term emergency situations so when we turn on the stress response and can't turn it off, we're headed for some type of breakdown in the body. When we have long periods of stress like this, I think a lot of times you see people who, I've always said for a very long time that whatever the weakest link in your body is, whatever the weakest organ, whatever predisposition to um, weakness and either a 
It could be a system, it could be an actual organ or a group of organs, whatever that weakest part in your body is so that the energy is the weakest there. So you get the least amount of energetic flow there. That is where your illness is going to manifest. So a, a common thing that happens to people who are sent more sensitive of, of, in their solar plexus and their stomach is that they'll have a bad gut reaction, a bad gut feeling. If your stress always goes to your gut, whether it's your intestines or your stomach, then you're gonna either have sour stomach or you're going to have, perhaps you have a lot of um, gas, maybe you have upper GI problems because it doesn't just stay to your stomach. Now it's starting to go up your esophagus and your trachea. You can have, up, you can actually have upper GI problems. For some people, instead of, you know, the, the fear gripping them in their stomach, for some of them, it takes their breath away. And so it manifests in bronchitis. It could be bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, you know, if, if asthma, different types of things that are related to respiration. And those are all fear responses, as you know. It could be a lower back issue, or you could even have a combination of one, two, or three or more of these. In more severe cases, you can have people that will come down with with neurological disorders. And so it runs the gamut, but basically the root cause of all of those things is fear and how we're processing it, how we're using our body to interpret the feeling of fear and that stress response. So when we turn on the stress response and we can't turn it off, we're headed for some type of breakdown in the body. So let's say you keep, you, you keep turning on the fight or flight system due to some threatening circumstance in your life. Pause button. You know, maybe you have a perpetual problem with the IRS, or maybe you have a perpetual X uh, with regards to um, spousal support uh, in either direction, either paying it or receiving it. Or maybe you have a perpetual amount of stress because of maybe the number of kids that you have and the number of kids that you're taking care of. Or maybe you have kids and your, maybe you have kids and parents that you're watching or kids and in-laws that you're having to care for or any combination of situations like this. Maybe it's your family situation plus all your employees at work. Make no mistakes, your employees are like your kids. Whether you, they're your direct employees where you own the company or if you're a manager to a company where you manage a group of people, anybody who's managed other adults you know, will attest to the fact that in some instances it can be like herding cats and it can be a very stressful situation depending on the individual, their management style, and the group of individuals that you're managing.